Welcome back, everyone, to part four of our look at the story of Genghis Khan. I hope you guys have been enjoying this as much as I have. I've learned a lot already, uh, and I'm excited to learn the rest of the story. As always, there are links in the description, not only to the original content for episode four, but also back to episode one of my reaction series so you can get caught up if you are new to the series. Also, if you haven't already, please consider hitting that subscribe button. It does help a lot. It communicates to YouTube uh, that you want to see more from this channel. And if you turn on those notifications, that helps even more. Uh, and as with every video, the more you like, comment, and watch the whole video to the end. All of those things help this channel, and I would be grateful for that. Real quick, want to address one thing that a number of people have asked about. And I've seen a couple people answer the question already, but for those of you who may not have seen or read through all the comments, uh, I've had a number of people asking, uh, you know, because we've talked a lot about uh, belief systems in this series and, and uh, the ideas of being chosen and being protected by the gods and things like that. And a lot of people have been asking, well, what exactly was the religion of Genghis Khan? Um, he was actually a Tengrist, which was a, a form of animism and shamanism. And uh, it was the primary religion uh, for the steppe people in this part of the world. Uh, primary religion for the Turks, the Huns, other groups of people. Uh, so it stands to reason that would be the case. But I did also find out a couple of other interesting things. Number one, Ong Khan, who was kind of the mentor to uh, Genghis Khan, had actually become a Christian convert. He was he was a Christian uh, later on well i guess this actually happened before genghis khan's rise to power i don't know what happened later on in on khan's life uh, but i also know that genghis khan as we've discussed was very tolerant of other faiths he was very familiar with islam with christianity with buddhism with other and he had met with christian missionaries and buddhist monks and different things and uh i guess the easiest way to understand it is that the tolerance wouldn't have been seen as a big deal because by nature the Mongols were uh, viewed religion as kind of a personal thing, whereas many religions at this time, especially Christianity and Islam, did not see religion as a personal thing between you and your belief system. It was more of a corporate, it was a collective, it was a state thing. Uh, and so there's a lot more tolerance in a place where religion's really not involved in the state, but it's more just kind of a one-on-one a -on -one thing and whatever you believe, hey, that's what you believe. So let's go ahead and dive into part four. The year is 1202, the dawn of a new century. Temujin Khan now rivals Jamaka in power. The future of the Mongols could fall to either of them. And Temujin, already a radical, is about to institute yet another set of revolutionary changes to a society that has hardly changed at all in a thousand years. So that's an excellent point there that he's making that, um, you know, in some societies, change is constant. And so we're used to change. And so when things change, it's not a big deal. When you are largely the same as you have been for not only generations, but many generations and centuries, uh, change can either be very welcome or very divisive. And in this case, it's both. One year after the defeat of the Taichit, an aging Ong Khan sent Temujin on a new campaign to, once again, plunder the Tartars. Having now grown as a leader and a warrior, Temujin introduced new changes and tactics which would forever alter the way back... Wait, let's go back and read those for a second. Warrior. Temujin... Looting has been reduced until after raiding. This will improve... work to improve flow. Spoils are now redistributed to all participants by raid leader. Mercy got nerfed again. Anna is best healer. <laughs> That's awesome. Temujin introduced new changes and tactics which would forever alter the way battle was done on the steppe. See, traditional Mongol raids had warriors rushing into camps while their victims either fled or stayed to defend their possessions. The fighting would then devolve into chaos as the raiders raced to loot and pillage, trying to grab the best prizes for themselves rather than chasing down enemy warriors. Temujin realized that these acts of personal greed got in the way of a more complete victory and left his troops vulnerable to counterattack from resentful enemies. This raid would be different. He declared that no looting would take place until total victory had been accomplished. 
Looting would then be done in an organized fashion, with all goods being brought to Temujin and then redistributed among his followers. That's actually brilliant. I mean, that's not the kind of thing that I would have ever thought of. That's absolutely brilliant. And this, this shows a mind that is willing to adapt based on the circumstances. You know, this is a time and place in history, and we still have some ways in which we operate under tradition, right? Um, but, you know, things have always been done that way, so we need to keep doing them that way. But he looks and he sees a very specific problem, which is people being more concerned about getting loot than about winning the battle. And so he comes up with a very specific solution to that that's going to say, okay, you're still going to get your loot, but first we're going to deal with the battle. This That's really good stuff. Using much the same system that mountain hunters used to distribute kills at the end of a group hunt, Temujin also ordered that a share of the wealth be allocated to anybody widowed or orphaned as a result of the raid. This ensured that what had happened to his mother when his father was killed would never again happen to another Mongol family. These changes guaranteed him the support of the poorest people in the tribe, and inspired loyalty among his soldiers, who now knew that their families would be cared for if they fell in battle. So who then, then does this oppose? Because if you're pleasing everybody, you're probably pleasing nobody. Uh, so anything that's going to be popular with the poorest people, popular with the soldiers, good chance it's probably going to be unpopular with the rich and the powerful and the influential. So I'll be curious to see if that's how this goes down. But these changes alienated some of his more well-off followers, as it denied them their traditional right to distribute prizes to their underlings as they saw fit. Still, it was a trade worth the making, as this move greatly centralized the power of his rule and incentivized loyalty. In enriching Temujin, his followers were also enriching themselves. This new system was a resounding success. For the second time, Temujin defeated the Tartars, and by postponing the looting until the end of the campaign, the army amassed more wealth than ever before. So I'm starting to understand now what brought Temujin, Genghis Khan, uh, to this position where he is able to conquer so much of the known world. It's the same reason why Julius Caesar is successful. It's the same reason why Napoleon is successful. It's doing things nobody has done before. I shouldn't say nobody because there's nothing new under the sun. Any concept that someone brings about has probably been thought of already, uh, but taking it and, and perfecting it or putting it to mass use. A completely off-topic example of this, for example, is when people think of the advent of the automobile, who do people typically think of? They people people think of Henry Ford. Henry and a lot of people are under the the misconception that Henry Ford invented the automobile because of that, but he didn't. What he did was he took an idea. I think traditionally it's it's uh, credits given to Carl Benz, but you know all of these kinds of inventions, the airplane, the automobile, any of these things are multiple people over many generations working toward it. Uh, but Henry Ford took it and he mastered it. He made it work on a grand scale that made it available to a lot of people. Uh, you know, I can remember in the 1980s, my grandfather, who was in, he was a TV repairman, telling me that they were developing these TVs that you could hang on a wall like a picture. And I thought that was crazy. And 20 years later, they were just starting to come about because there's a difference between inventing something and making it practical and making it affordable. So what Genghis Khan is doing is he's taking ideas that have been used, but they've never been used in a huge way and on a grand scale. Napoleon does that with some of his military tactics and the way he builds his army. He takes these ideas and he makes them work. And with everybody else operating under a different system, they're just no match. And that's what Genghis Khan's able to do here. There was, however, a new problem. In keeping with their usual policy of executing leaders and integrating everybody else, they had now captured almost an entire army and all of the civilians. The old method had worked great when they were dealing with a clan of hundreds, but the Tartars numbered in the thousands. 
It was imperative to Temujin to end the vicious, constant conflicts between steppe lineages, and it seemed to him that integrating everyone under one unified banner was the only way to achieve this. But in order to bring the numerous Tartars into his Khanate, he would need the full support of his followers. He summoned a Kuraltai to discuss a solution, and... Once again, doesn't unilaterally make the decision on his own. He makes it a corporate decision. You know, sometimes you have to do this in leadership where you know you have the right idea, you know that the decision that you want to have happen is the right one, but that doesn't mean everybody else is on board or that they're at that place yet. And so sometimes you have to make it feel like it was their idea, even though it was your idea, in order to sell it. And the one they found was vicious, but effective. They summoned all of the Tartar men and ordered each one to walk by a cart. Every male taller than the linchpin, which held the wheels on the cart, was executed. Once the older and larger Tartar males were culled, the remaining men and their families were taken in as full members of his tribe. Temujin adopted another Tartar orphan and took two aristocratic Tartar women as additional wives. That handled, Temujin had yet more ancient traditions to abolish. If he really wanted to establish lasting peace among the steppe tribes, he would have to radically transform their military and tribal system. He would have to do away with the traditional system of kin groups altogether. Mm. He organized his warriors into squads of ten, who were then ordered to live and fight together. These groups were of mixed origin and lineage. By forcing people to serve as units rather than kin groups, Temujin managed to break their ancient lineages and ethnic identities. This reminds me a little bit of what happens in Scotland uh, a couple of centuries ago, where, you know, for, for centuries you have the clan system. And as long as there are clans, the clans are going to uh, ally with one another against other clans. They're going to support or oppose your, your actions. And so to create a nation, to create, um, you know, a nation where it doesn't matter what clan you're a part of, you support the nation, not your clan first, uh, you've got to break that. And so they do the same thing. Uh, really, really interesting how he's choosing to do this. But I get it. You know, it, it keeps the clans from fighting, and that means that the clan leaders are no longer going to be thinking, well, if I can just get a few more groups on my side, I can take over. This is all about power and central authority and completely shattering what made this impossible in the past. Each squad began with the oldest as their leader, but they could elect any man among them mm. if they chose. Ten of these squads formed a company of 100 men, one of whom they elected to be their leader, and ten of those companies formed a battalion of 1,000 individuals. The leader of each battalion was chosen by Temujin, further cementing his power. And, under the new system, all members of the tribe, regardless of age or gender, had to perform public service for the benefit of the tribe, including caring for herds, gathering fuel, cooking, repairing weapons, or even performing music to entertain the troops. So this is interesting, too, because these are jobs that would have been seen as beneath some people. And now you're saying everybody's got to do it. You're creating equality. This is really fascinating stuff. And just like that, there were no more lineages or classes. Everyone worked for the benefit of the tribe, and everyone reaped the rewards. Finally, Temujin created a closed territory designated as the homeland of the Mongols. For its location, he chose the sacred site where he had hidden from the market raiders in his youth, and he closed it to all outsiders except the Mongol royal family, who would continue to bury their dead and conduct ritual gatherings there for the next two centuries. Hmm. This land became the secret ritual center of the new Mongol identity. After almost 20 years of work, Temujin now controlled most of the Mongols, but Jamaka was still a large and looming threat. Ong Khan was getting older, but it was not yet clear who would take over for him. So Temujin decided to force Ong Khan's hand, and proposed that his eldest son, Jochi, marry one of Ong Khan's daughters. This would be an acknowledgement of Temujin as his heir. Ong Khan's eldest son, who had no following of his own, was envious of Temujin's power and relationship with his father, and strongly encouraged Ong Khan to reject the proposal, despite the fact that doing so would be a grave insult. Ong Khan was swayed, and he rejected Temujin uh. outright. Fearing a military response, though, Ong Khan quickly devised a nefarious plot to rid himself of Temujin through trickery. 
He sent Temujin a message saying that he had changed his mind, setting a wedding date and inviting Temujin to come alone to celebrate with the family. Do not so Temujin set out with a small band to see his patron, confident that he was about to secure his position to succeed Ong Khan as future ruler of the Central Steps. Then, just one day's ride from Ong Khan's court, one of Temujin's allies rode up with terrible news. Ong Khan had an army nearby, preparing to wipe him out. Mm. Temujin was trapped. Wildly outnumbered, separated from his allies with the enemy at his heels, he could not afford to fight. He did the only thing he could do. He ordered his small group to scatter in all directions and fled. Temujin was devastated. This was supposed to be his moment of triumph. When he reunited with his followers far from Ong Khan's territory, he found that only a few remained. Wow. Some of his relatives had deserted in a panic. Others had simply gotten lost on the steppe. This remind again, I mentioned a couple of episodes ago the parallels that I saw with Admiral Yi. Climb, 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 get knocked all the way down to the bottom. Climb, 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 knocked all the way down to the bottom, climb again. Some people are just of the personality and of the spirit that no matter how many times you knock them to the bottom, they're going to find a way back up, and this is one of those people. Now what few remained faced starvation in their remote exile, and his newly united people were now without their leader. Temujin resolved to act quickly while Ong Khan basked in the glory of his victory. He sent messengers to his tens of thousands of followers, hoping that they would follow his order to assemble. And amazingly, they did. Imagine tens of thousands of people, separated from their leader but still converging. So this goes back to everything he's done for the last several years, right? He has created a new system that has given people a voice and given people a power they never thought they could have. Yeah, they're going to be loyal to that. I am not the least bit surprised about their loyalty. Because this isn't about loyalty because you are obligated to be loyal. This is because you choose to follow a guy like this. Maintaining order and discipline. This was the effect of Temujin's new discipline. His new societal structure. This army thundered toward the unsuspecting Ong Khan, who feasted and celebrated in his palatial golden yurt. Loyal followers had gone so far as to leave fresh horses for Temujin's army along the way, so they could continue night and day without resting. In the middle of the night, and without warning, Temujin's army completely surrounded the enemy camp and crashed down on Ong Khan's court, days before he thought they'd arrive. Nobles fled in all directions, including Ong Khan and Jamaka, who managed to escape the fighting and flee to the nearby Naiman tribe, the greatest of the tribes not yet conquered by Temujin. Jamaka made it safely across the Naiman border, but Ong Khan was stopped by a guard who couldn't believe that this haggard old man was the great Khan he claimed to be, and killed him. Temujin now turned his sights to the Naiman, Jamaka's oh. new ally. Now, at last, the decisive battle against Jamaka had finally, finally come. For the first time, Temujin's new military organization would be put to the test in an all-out battle. Squads of ten advanced silently in the pre-dawn darkness, so the enemy couldn't see how many people were attacking or from which direction. The squads would then attack and then immediately flee in different directions. Make and this is why, if you've ever played a game like Mountain Blade Bannerlord, the horse archers are just so annoying if you don't have them. Because they'll come in, they'll launch their arrows, and then they'll take off and you can't catch up to them. It's, it's incredibly skilled warfare to be able to ride on a horse and shoot a bow while you're moving. Um, but if you can do it and do it well and you've got trained people, they're hard to deal with. Making retaliation impossible. After hours of these harrying hit-and-run attacks, Temujin advanced with a long line of troops who fired their arrows and then melted back behind the next line, their replacements. The Naiman attempted to counter this by spreading out a long, thin line to meet the attacking archers and avoid being flanked. In response, Temujin switched tactics yet again, rearranging his men into a narrow, deep configuration which allowed them to chisel through the thinned mm. Naiman lines. Victory was swift and complete. Jamaka fled again and, in a poetic twist of fate, ended up hiding in the woods just as Temujin once had as a boy, himself now a disgraced outcast bandit at the age of 40. In time, his followers found and delivered him to Temujin. Jamaka asked only for an honorable death, which Temujin granted. 
it was finally over. So what is an honorable death in this case? Let's take a look. Okay, it's what I thought it was, which was that he um, he asked to be executed by a noble death without spilling blood. His request was granted by having his back broken by Temujin's soldiers. Pretty horrible way to die if you think about it, but um, it has something to do with their beliefs in terms of um, what happens to your spirit afterwards. If there's no shedding of blood, I think your spirit is able to go where it needs to go much easier. I don't fully understand it. Maybe somebody can answer in the comment section below and fill us in on exactly what that's about. But there you have it, episode four. It seems now as Temujin has conquered all his rivals, so now that he's united all the Mongol people, obviously he can go on to conquer new lands. And so I'm sure that's what we're going to talk about in the final two episodes. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. Please hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow with the next episode. Thanks for watching.